I tend to find that a, a really successful salesperson has always had an engineering background in this industry. Um, you have to actually know what the ins and outs of the product. It's not as simple as just selling one single machine or product, or as you said, it could be like, uh, you know, um, a beer or something like that. It's not one single product that you're selling, you're selling the solution. And it tends to, I, I tend to find that with salespeople in general, especially in this industry, they, they have the background because they're the only ones that know the technical ins and outs of it. You actually are looking for the pain points. You're looking for the, you're trying to visualize the actual solution, not, not just selling a single product. You're actually trying to uh, be a kind of consultant to them as well and making sure that that problem, you've got a way of fixing it, no matter how, how much out of the box it is. Um, there's a way of fixing that problem. You're listening to the Sales Today podcast, and I'm your host, Fred Copestake. On this podcast, we explore how sales professionals can develop a modern approach to winning business, the application of virtual selling techniques, how to create meaningful business relationships, and much more. Why not take our free collaborative selling scorecard to see how your sales approach suits today's environment? You'll find a link in the show notes. And welcome to this episode of the Sales Today podcast, where I'm delighted to be joined by George Brown. George is an executive recruiter specializing in the areas of packaging, warehouse, automation. Um, so, George, welcome, first up. Hi, Fred. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me here. Second in your family to be on the Sales Today podcast, <laughs> mate. <laughs> I know, I know. Run, runs in the genes. So I don't want to put any pressure on about kind of making sure your answers are better and more valuable and everything else. But uh, we're not talking about negotiation today. So Dad Phil is, is safe. <laughs> um, no, we're talking about recruitment because that's your, that's your area. And, and you're recruiting. Well, you're recruiting who? Tell, tell me broadly who so you're recruiting. I, I pretty much go uh, all in on the sales folk um, across packaging and warehouse automation. Uh, so typically it'll be sales engineers, sales managers, business development managers, and then working on up towards um, VP of sales and that kind of level as well, executive search. Okay, cool. And so I think if I understand well, you have, before you started to kind of really niche and specialize and get into this area, you, you've worked in a kind of a broader area of kind of sales, sales in general. Yeah, yeah. So I started off, I suppose, in the warehouse automation as a whole. And yeah. that's, you know, it's a huge, huge, huge market to go after. And then I noticed that with the engineering backgrounds, um, the packaging automation side was actually, it was a, it's a bit of a niche area, but still as big of a market. And uh, the, the the actual requirements in it are, um, are quite interesting, especially from an engineering standpoint. Okay, so, okay, so, from a pure engineering point of view, you need a different sort of engineer. Yeah. And what I'm interested in is that when we're talking about salespeople in the engineering space, they're often a bit different to engine sorry, to, to salespeople we might see kind of in the broader broader world, you know, selling yeah. I don't know, crisps, snacks, beer, trucks, chicken wings, I don't know. So um how how are this kind of salespeople that you're dealing with different what idiosyncrasies what things are you seeing in them well i i tend to find that a, a really successful salesperson has always had an engineering background in this industry um you have to actually know what the ins and outs of the product it's not as simple as just selling one single machine or product or as you said it could be like uh you know um a beer or something like that it's not one single product that you're selling you're selling the solution and it tends to, I tend to find that with salespeople in general, especially in this industry, they, they have the background because they're the only ones that know the technical ins and outs of it. You actually are looking for the pain points. You're looking for the, you're trying to visualize the actual solution, not, not just selling a single product. You're actually trying to uh, be a kind of consultant to them as well and making sure that that problem, you've got a way of fixing it, no matter how, how much out of the box it is. Um, there's a way of fixing that problem. Ah, okay. And it, is that because they actually have to fix the problem, kind of as if they had a bunch of spanners and they were going to sort of <laughs> do that? I don't know if it's spanners, but you know what I mean. Is it that? And or is it that they've got the credibility of being someone that's recognized who could do that and so that the customer is more comfortable 
and happier to speak to them about it. Both. Yeah. I mean, if someone's got the background there, anybody is going to be trusting the person that has worked on the system and actually knows what that machine is capable of. Um, with, with the machines, it, you aren't solving the problem. You are trying to find the find and fix that problem. And any any sales folk can kind of sell an actual problem. Um, no, sell the actual kind of um, machinery, but to actually know which machinery is needed to fix that that problem, that specific area that has uh, has an issue, and solve certain things within uh, within that kind of warehouse or that facility. You have to have someone that's worked in the facility and worked on those machines itself. So someone who's good in this role is able to walk into, into the warehouse, say, and start speaking to somebody and go, I know what's going on in this guy's life, life, you know, work life. <laughs> um, and these are the things that he'll be having to try to do. Yeah. And if he's like everyone else, it's probably this thing, which is a right pain. Yes. <laughs> yeah, they'll struggle with it. It's taking too much of his time. He'll probably get dead fed up with it. And, and I can say, hey, look, mate, I know, <laughs> this is what you're trying to do. There is a better way. And yeah. they'll go, awesome. Where yeah. have you been? Well, I was doing your job before. That's why I know. Yeah. Is, is that kind of yeah, a very simplified way of kind of explaining what's going on? Yeah, yeah. It, it tends to be that so some problems come up with one company and then you can copy and mimic that that idea to another. Um, but it, it comes down to the fact that the, the actual issue, you should have that solution there. And, and I mean, sometimes you will have salespeople that will work with an engineer um, to assist on finding that finding that solution. But the, the the best salespeople in the industry are the ones that they can do both. And I think it is more about I know what issue you're you're dealing with. We've either dealt with it before, or we can definitely fix it. We've got we've got the we've got the solution. It, it's all about solution sales, and um, I think that's why the engineering side is, is so valuable to it. It is all about solution sales, and it's solution to the problem, solution to the issue, the challenge, concern. Do you ever see salespeople or sort of you know, engineers who are transitioning into sales who are sticking too closely to the product, to the actual engineering piece, you know, the machine, if you like, and so they're sort of hammering home machine, 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 and the customer's going, I don't know what you're telling me all this. I'm trying to solve this problem out over here. They're not making that. They're not making that link. Sometimes I, I have come across people and that will that will, they, they prefer the engineering side because they might not be that comfortable, um, you know, with, with the people, you know, speak, speaking and then and, um, and dealing with dealing with being in a customer facing position. And, you know, you will have those people that will stick to uh, those kind of roles. But there's always in a in a decent sized company, you will always have perhaps a team of two or three that will have one that is pure engineer. They will ramble on and on and on about, you know, each part of the machine. You've got one guy that can, uh, or woman that can just sell, sell the whole thing, really build, build the trust in the company and what they can do, share some statistics, share some facts, but they tend to work together and you do have people that stay a bit closer to the engineering side, but a lot of them actually like staying around that. And then, getting involved slowly very slowly into the sales um and i think it comes from experience then you've you'll learn and typically as well when you're in the facilities in the warehouses you'll also be speaking with someone that's potentially an engineer someone that knows what they're looking for they'll they'll understand all the terminology as well um so that's always you know a way that 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 kind of engineering language they can uh, <laughs> they can translate it quite well yeah no so, so if i start paraphrase then what you're saying is that sometimes people will will stay in their comfort zone yeah. like, I, I know the engineering piece i've done it i've done it for years i know how it works i can talk about this forever and that's safe for me yeah. going and almost like assuming that people have a problem or kind of having a, an edge shake guess at it, it it just feels a bit risky doesn't it yeah and then yeah. it involves skills it involves skills which people might not have been set up with to go to do that because yeah. it's not always a logical way to do that yeah, it's in their comfort zone. They'll stay in the engineering zone. I think that goes for, you know, I think a lot of positions going outside the comfort zone. If you have a, if you haven't, if it's not like something that you can easily do, and especially when these are very large projects, I mean, they're in the millions, some of these. It's, you know, hundreds of millions even. So you do tend to find people stay in their comfort zone and maybe have that partnership with a sales or a BD person coming in to help. But you do you do tend to find that eventually they'll 
they will just fall into sales at some point, whether it's an application engineering role or a sales engineering role, something that just is a bit of both, they'll slowly make that transition. And that is something that that's where the that's where it all starts, really. That's the one one kind of next step from an engineer to a salesperson. Yeah, I, again, might be simplifying things here. The way I see it kind of go is that it's sort of, here is somebody, they're an excellent engineer. They know how to fix stuff. They do jobs well. And then sometimes they have to go and see customers to do stuff on site because they do the job well. They fix things. Yeah, customer thinks they're great. They're also probably quite good with people, actually. Yeah, they're decent folks to be around. They do this a few times. Company says, you ought to be in sales, really, because customers really like you and you fix stuff. Yeah, oh. and they've done an excellent job and been very successful and are being pushed forward because of being good at things into suddenly a new world where now it's fully sales and there are things which you do do differently. And they've not been trained to do this. They've not kind of had I don't know, been equipped yeah. <laughs> to have those conversations at an earlier stage or in this slightly w illogical to many engineers way in that you don't tell people all about yourself yeah. to start with, which doesn't make any sense to them at all. Yeah. Is, is that is that fair? You see that kind of that progression and that happens and it causes some issues? hundred uh, percent. You you see people that they, they they start becoming more customer facing, and that that comes down to experience. They 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 go out, they meet the people, and then eventually they start meeting more people, start meeting more clients, and then it, they start being that kind of a crucial part of that sales process. That at some point, either a manager or the other company, they'll be like, "I want to deal with them. They're going to be the the salesperson I'm going to deal with." And then it. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes and there is that kind of gap where they don't quite know how to pitch it in a sales manner, but they know the engineering terminology, they know everything about that, but actually pitching it, that's that's the 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 gap that they're kind of you kind of need to fill as well when you do that transition. Yeah, I see that. So so okay, so we're saying there's this gap, this transition gap thing, which is a sort yeah. of okay, you know how to do this stuff. We're gonna ask you to do this if you don't know. Why aren't people being prepped? Why aren't we saying, hey, we're going to ask you to do a new thing here. You need new tools. You need new techniques. You need a new way of thinking. Why, why do you think that falls? Why do you think that falls flat? I, I I'm think, desperate to know as a sales trainer. Okay. <laughs> I, I think it comes down to uh, the last point about comfort zones. I, I, I think engineers do typically stay in engineering because they might not find it comfortable speaking to uh, to someone about trying to pitch something. Yeah. And you rarely ever get the chance to actually go out and, and do that with a new company. So it, it's kind of like you'll be doing the engineering side and then all of a sudden you'll have that one chance to, and, and you might even accidentally do it, is it accidentally selling the system, selling the solution. <laughs> You'll, 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 you'll do all the drafting, the designs, and you'll, you won't even realize it, but you're pitching that, but they might not have the sales terminology, the sales jargon to actually, actually pitch it in the right way, but they've got all the, the technical parts, right? But the actual, okay, now that's actually, I didn't even realize I've just sold, I, I could be selling this now. I could be upselling. I could, I could do a lot more. I think that that's where the gap is, is it comfort zones. Um, and potentially they just haven't had the opportunity to, to actually, pursue that area and be comfortable in a customer facing position they might they might stay in their comfort zone yeah 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 the, there's naturally some parts of the sale where we get to this point that we're sat alongside the customer we, we're co-creating we're collaborating we, we're looking at it from the same side trying to fix the same thing you get what you need i'll get what i need happy days i think it's sometimes the bits before which is kind of earning the right to that conversation which if mm. somebody has made the shift to sales they aren't prepped in and which people aren't putting their hand up and saying, I don't know how to do this. Hmm. Now, whether that's, again, it's against the nature of somebody who's quite successful to realise, I, I need help here. Yeah. Whether, I don't know, I think the organisation has let them down because they should realise that that's where there's a gap. But it's yeah. just something which seems to to fall short. And it's actually quite a simple fix. Yeah. Or again, is this just me? wanting that to be the case? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, I mean... I suppose it's easier when the salesperson puts their hand up and says, oh, I don't know the engineering part. I can't do this. I can't, I can't do this without having someone that knows the system. So yeah. the, the the salesperson will probably put their hand up and say, I don't actually know this system enough to sell what they need. So they'll get the engineer involved. And then the engineer has kind of had half the sell. The, the sales part is almost half done. You've got the introduction there. It, it's all about now the engineer's part to, to do the solution pitch it, 
picture exactly they're they're just pitching what they've got on their their, their paper but the salesperson is pitching for the sale and i think that's where there's a, a bit of a, a the, the gap is the salesperson will say i don't know the engineering side but the engineering people might not realize that they're they're falling into the sales process then as soon as they work with that sale the salesperson they're involved and they might need that support to you know be able to speak with someone um and 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 pitch that pitch that product the solution in the right way because they they can show off all the paperwork but it's actually being able to say oh this is the problem this is what we can do that's the salesperson uh, that that's the gap yeah i, I think you're right and i wonder because i've sort of done a couple of podcasts in this series already whether there's also a bit of resistance from the engineers who are sort of saying no i know what i'm doing here I am successful. I understand systems. I've got a process. This is why this will work. And when somebody's telling them, right, here are some new processes, some new systems, because there are different ways of operating, they don't like that. They find it hard to, I don't know, absorb, if you like, and and, and take on this new way of operating, which isn't what they've been doing for, for a great for, for a big part of what their you know what their career looks like. Yeah, they're, 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 it's comfort zones again. They they, yeah, they, yeah. they 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 want to stick to what they're good at, and yeah. um, they they they're just not going to be comfortable just going straight into it like that. And I think then I, I can't say for sure, but I think it's also a confidence thing as well about kind of they might the, some of these projects generally are like fifty million, a hundred million. Some of them are hundred, hundred couple of hundred thousand, but. Typically, when you're when you're at one of the big companies doing the whole solution, they're going to be upwards of probably minimum three million, and then upwards, yeah. depending on the company, it could go fifty, hundred. I've seen projects around two hundred million, and these, yeah. it, all it takes is one thing to go wrong. So, if they might just get a bit nervous, overwhelmed by it, and that's where you know, that's where the team really gets involved and having that salesperson that can deal with that. And I think that's why engineers find a bit. Have, might have a bit of a confidence issue there maybe not not all of them but the, when it's such a big project on the on the line it, they might just kind of stay in their comfort zone let someone else do the pitch they'll just provide the paperwork and the designs yeah i mean when you're going up in value in these and i've worked with some teams where we get up to a billion because yeah. they're, they're selling some really big engineering stuff there are more people involved and i'm talking from the customer side the decision making unit is bigger yeah, it's because it's such you know, big numbers, such big value, it's so complex. There's other, there's lots of people who've got lots of things that they're trying trying to achieve, and we need to understand that. No. And when I've seen it to be really effective is when you might have business development or, or pure sales or whatever you want to call them involved, but the whole team understand what selling looks like, so they can contribute their part in yeah. and bring you know that their, their, their bit of the jigsaw if you like, and the, the the team puts together a better a better full on solution there. Yeah, I uh, I completely agree. I know one thing that I uh, I tend to mention with some companies when I'm I'm thinking of how to build out a sales team for them, or you know if they're saying oh, we we need to build something, we need to start with one person, then we we need to build out to a whole business unit. I uh, I tend to think of it as like a, a football team. Yeah, you've got you've got the salespeople, you've got the engineers, you've got the solutions applications, and you've got the just kind of the maintenance engineers as well. Um, I can't manage it. You, you've got all these different parts and they all play, they almost play a game like it's someone's bringing, so someone's got to score it. Someone's got to, you know, do do the passes around the back to get it, to get it, you know, get it all in line. I I, I always come back to that and um, it, it, I just find it quite interesting, as you said, when, when it's bigger projects, you'll have bigger teams. And when you've got a business unit that can have someone managing their account, someone that's selling, someone that's, you know, uh, being the engineer, someone's maybe just doing the maintenance, it's almost like the. It's almost like you're going from the goalie all the way up to the salesperson. The salesperson's the one that scores it most of the time, anyway. But you will have those chances for like the engineer to 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 get up there as well. And I think it's interesting. That's almost like the the steps and the the steps to getting into sales for an engineer. You'll start off just an engineer, maybe maintenance engineer. Then it's applications, solutions, business development, account management, and then it's kind of anything up there. But it, 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 as you said, it is. It's a team effort when it's on those big projects, and you need everyone to kind of know what they're doing. But they also very much have to be in the sales sales function. I think even as an engineer, you you have to know a bit about sales, and then as through experience, you'll you start picking up more and more that 
you can be the one that that that's gonna gonna be building the sale uh, getting winning the project yeah right so now you're gonna be testing me on football knowledge here but it's not my specialized subject <laughs> okay so strikers strikers put the ball in the back of the net normally that's what they know how to do and I sometimes run back and defend but it's all about scoring we want to win we want to win yeah. deals winger might sometimes have a chance to do that so they yeah. need to know how to do that thing when they're in that position yeah. fullback might be in that position might <laughs> for some reason be in a goal scoring up don't just go well it's not my job I want to get in the back of the net I don't do this thing I don't even know I'm here no they know how to do it they've got enough skills to recognise what's going on that they could do that because the other guys aren't around yeah. or at least pass it to the person that's been better they, people appreciate what's going on around them and can then either do it themselves or actually get it to the person who's better. And, yeah. and that's what we're trying to do. That's what you're trying to do when you're building a team is going, at the moment, you just put, you just put, you've got a whole load of fullbacks. Yeah. <laughs> you, you'll never score anything. Oh, I won't lose anything. Yeah, but okay. You'll be made at the table always. You need to have more of a balance. And that's how okay. you will try to help people put a team together. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, you, you've, You've got all, all the different positions play different roles and it depends on you could go into a lot more detail on you know the exact positions if someone's a winger striker or whatever midfielder it, it can be anything but you know you, you've got the wingers let, let's say let's say they're the one that get the opportunity they get the lead and they took it to the person to score that you some some teams will have just their striker they're, they're just there to score they do that. But then the midfielders, you know, they they've got to build out the project. They've got to work from the back, work from the engineers' input, and that's the, that's a step up. So yeah, I I, I think it, it's an interesting way I, I pitch it to to companies. But of course, it depends on what's your first step. Have you got the engineer that can support the person that is just going to hunt, just hunt the business, get everything done, or are you going to get an engineer that can then do? It will be a risk, but if they can go out and hunt the business. Then there, that gap is where, you know, you can have a, a smaller company having someone that's been in the the defending position, the, the engineering position, and then going up to uh, to actually winning the goals. There, there, that's where the value is. Again, testing my football knowledge. <laughs> so does this mean we've got to have a brilliant midfielder, <laughs> midfield yeah, general, yeah. <laughs> farming everything out? This is all yeah. going around and, and just kind of being being that kind of hub of pulling oh. right people, right time, do the right thing, and actually that will make for a very strong approach. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they can fix the problems. They can go get the ball back and they can potentially go off, go off and score it themselves. That's the, I think that's the gap. That's the, you can see it's like the back there, up there, there. Then you've got the midfielders. This is a really weird way to describe it, but it, we've uh, lost the would, American audience. It, out, <laughs> it, would, uh, it would be easier to explain, but the, you know, you've got that. The, it's basically a three-step process, three stages. I think is the you, the en engineer, then your kind of sales engineer, or there's so many different terms for it. every company is different, and then you've got the actual sales. But in general, that, that that's how I've seen it in the market. Okay, so typically they are the roles. So we turn it into back into engineering terms. But they have to come together as the team. If they if they if they're playing alone, okay, they might be successful. Maybe some of the smaller projects, but these bigger projects, they have to come together. And we've got to kind of get that. Yeah, I'm going to have to say synergy because I can't think of another word that is no, synergy exactly that describes right. synergy. <laughs> but it, but it yeah, is, it is exactly that. If you if they're not coming together a team, well, I think especially when it's bigger projects, you're going to be dealing with a big client here. You're going to be dealing with you know what we call one of the top dogs. If it's a big project to work on, they also want to see that there's a team at hand that whenever there's an issue someone can fix it and uh when it's a smaller project yeah you can have one one or two people in there but bigger projects you are going to need a team staying with football then so i'm again i'm thinking you know how elite teams are structured and, and again even the setup of them they've got a manager who doesn't run on and try and score the goals hmm. Which some managers do in sales world. So yeah, take that as one lesson. But the manager puts the game plan in place. That is how we play. Okay. And so we stick to this. And someone goes running off doing their own thing. It's like, no, you're not contributing. This is the way that we're going to win the game when we all do this in this way. It yeah. might be different in one game than another game. Yeah. This account, we're going to approach in this way. We might do it slightly different in another, but broadly, we'll have our way of playing. That's what yeah. we do. We know it's gonna it's gonna work for us because of who we've got and how we do stuff. Then they have the skills to be able to implement that. So 
when they're not playing the actual game, the teams are coming in and they've got the skills, drills, they've got coaches focusing on highly specific things to get them best as they possibly can be in all those areas, which will then contribute to the game plan. Yeah, And that's how they're moving forward and that's how they can be super successful. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think some of the best teams, uh, and I'm saying in both football and in, in, in companies uh, as well that I've worked with, they've always got someone that does, you know, they, they implement not just a strategy, but they're a mentor. And I always find that some of the best sales candidates I've spoken to have been through training, had mentorship from someone that has either been there in the past and done it, then been an engineer or a salesperson, they could be high up in the industry. But whatever it is, the, some of the best sales people I come across have had that mentor to say, this is how you could do this better. This is how, you know, you've done really well there. I think that's some of the advantages that big companies offer as well. Uh, sometimes you don't get that, but in the in the big big companies or when there's big teams, you have always got someone there as a coach, a mentor to be able to say, look, I've looked over everything. Maybe do this, maybe do that. And um, I think that's what that that's what makes that the, the perfect striker almost is someone that's there to mentor them, that coach there in the background. Yeah, and as I say, that game plan. So, do you get many salespeople, many people that you're working with, ask you the question? Okay, so this company over here, that's who we're talking about. What is that company's game plan? You know, well, what is the way they're going to go after the big deals, and how are they going to win them? Because I want to be part of that, and I want to be successful. Yeah, I mean, I, I get asked all the time, and I think you know, this week alone, I, because I'm, I am dealing with some senior roles at the moment, and I find the senior candidates are always asking that, and it's always it's always a good sign you're dealing with someone that is really clued up on what their what about their career and what the next step is, and I think when when they're asking it, they're asking it because they, it needs to align with them, and the game plan really is, you know, how are they already how are they doing at the moment? Is is this higher to shift something as well? Is there a market that they're trying to shift to? Is that why they're interested in me? Is that why you're speaking with me? So I find that, that it's always a great question to ask from a candidate perspective. But yeah, the the, the question alone on that game plan, um, it, can, it can win deals and it, it can lose deals. It can win candidates and lose candidates. There's companies that uh, I, I've seen have changed their game plan and all of a sudden people aren't interested in it. And, you know, it happens more often than you think as well. And it, unfortunately, sometimes it involves ends up being layoffs, people leaving. Stuff like that happens when there's a, a change of game plan that isn't communicated well. So it's always a good question from a candidate whenever I speak with them is what what is the game plan for? And how, how is it they go to market? Interesting. And I say some companies probably can't really answer that or they haven't really got one. That's why we're recruiting you. Okay, fine. That's a different conversation. To, no, they literally just make stuff up as they go along. Yeah. Um, it, it, tough it, sell that one. <laughs> it's sometimes, it's, I mean, sometimes the candidates um, will ask it and I, I, I don't have the answer for them. I mean, I'll be honest, so it's a lot of, not a lot, but some clients will always be a bit hesitant to share their game plan because they know that my job is to then reach out to candidates that could be a good fit and some of them might not be interested. So they can't risk their game plan being shared with a competitor or okay. another company in the industry. So you have to be a bit careful in answering it. And I always tend to try and hold, answer a bit of the question if I can, but hold off until, you know, that I've got kind of almost permission to say, oh, the, this is what they want to do and this is why you'd be a good fit. Unless that person is genuine, that it's a perfect match. So sometimes it can be quite difficult to answer that as a recruiter, just because there's a game plan and that's for one company. If that game plan is shared to another, what stops them from going after those clients and following that game plan? So there is that fine line where you've got to be careful. Yeah, yeah. And I suppose, yeah, I mean, game plan is probably the bigger thing, whereas a methodology to win business, so an opportunity management type, type structure is a, is a slightly different thing. But uh, okay, so... Wow, time is flying. Um, let's think of this. I don't know. Is it holding midfield or attacking midfield? This, this superstar. <laughs> this superstar that we've got. Yeah. If we're looking for a superstar, hmm. a superstar in engineering sales. Yeah. Three characteristics. Hmm. What three characteristics do you say? If I see those three, then we are looking good here. Yeah. Um. I suppose one of them, technically equipped. And I mean that as in they know the machinery, the inside and out. They they know exactly what each part is. But, you know, maybe not exactly all the part, but they know what that, that machine can do, what problems that can fix. That is the biggest one. Um, I think 
whenever I'm pitching a candidate, that's the first thing to say. They're technically equipped. They've got that. Um, the second one, I'd probably say network. Engineers, they might not be speaking with all these people, but they will be building a network that they might not even realize they've built. They've built, they've worked with companies. They might have worked at Amazons of the world. They, they might work with what it, in the US, there's going to be loads of different companies that, you know. So there's that, I think the network comes into a big play. And that's the second thing I'll also pitch, uh, especially when it's going into that sales front, because they might have some contacts that they can utilize in their next position that they've built trust with on the engineering side. And they might, they might not think about it, but when they go to a new position, they're like, that they've got that network, that that guy there, that, that guy, the woman, that that person can come in. They've already done the engineering side. Now we've got a chance to speak with him as a salesperson. We know he's got the got the job. We we know he's got he can do the job there. So I'd say the network is uh, is also very important. Um, so technically equipped the network, and then you know the the confidence as well. Um, the the. The third one is a bit one I have to really assess when I'm speaking with candidates. It's the confidence. How confident are they in actually pursuing sales? And salespeople and engineers and you know software engineers, all these different categories in, within a within my industry, it's almost like a different language for, for every single one of them. So speaking with an engineer is going to be completely different to speaking with a salesperson because salespeople. They like talking about their projects. They like talking about their big wins. Engineers might not realize that that's what I want to hear about. So as soon as they ask the right questions, like what's the game plan in the in this company? What projects have they got on? What am I walking into a cold desk or warm desk? Those are the questions that I'm like, I'm almost testing their confidence as well. Um, so it, uh, ultimately, that also shows how good are they at speaking with someone else? They have to be for me to be able to pitch them to someone they have to be have sold themselves to me pretty much sold their story their career to me and it's a good sign for salespeople is if they know how to sell themselves they they know how to sell a project in a way um so i think that comes with confidence training and uh, what i touched on earlier about having a mentor as well you 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 need you know you need the experience and the confidence there uh, that i that's my job to kind of assess that the most Awesome. Uh, they're interesting, interesting three things. Um, so if somebody's got those three things yeah. <laughs> and they're, they're thinking about, oh, I, I need it. I need someone on my side here. I'm looking to, to shift. Um, where can people get in touch with you? Where can they talk to you, George? Uh, LinkedIn, email, or just phone me. I, I'm on the phone all the time. So <laughs> I, uh, yeah, uh, I, any of those three, LinkedIn, uh, George Brown, or yeah. Okay. There, is your phone and email on, on LinkedIn? Yes, it's on LinkedIn. Okay, cool. Well, we will pop your LinkedIn uh, link <laughs> into the <laughs> show notes below so that people can find that easily. Um, thank you so much for coming on and, and sharing that. T time has flown. You, you've covered a, lot oh, no. of stuff, covered a lot of ground there. Um, re really decent of you to come along and, and, and share some of, your, some of your thinking. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Fred. Thank you for having me on it. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you for listening to the Sale Today podcast with me, your host, Fred Copestake. I hope you've enjoyed what you heard today. If you did, please get in touch and hit subscribe. And remember, you can take the Collaborative Selling Scorecard for free to check out how your sales approach works in today's environment. You'll find it in the show notes.